to our 9 o'clock worship here at Washington Street. Thank you for being with us for this hour of worship as we turn our minds and hearts toward God, our Father in Heaven. Um, I hope you filled out an attendance card. Uh, pass that to an aisle. We'll have some gentlemen pick those up in just a moment. <clears throat> Uh, I also hope you have a handout this morning. The bulletin has tons of information, including pictures of the high school class of 2023 uh, from uh, Washington Street. So you'll definitely want to be um, uh, be aware of all that. Tonight's a special service, in fact, at 6 o'clock to, to honor those seniors. We'll be singing some of their favorite songs and reading some of their favorite Bible passages and honoring them in, in a bit of a send-off as they uh, enter... Uh, adulthood, really, right? Kind of scary, right, parents? Exciting, exciting times. Hope you'll be back with us at 6 tonight. If you'd like to, let's stand as we begin our work. Standing on the promises of our King, through eternal ages and His grace is ringing, glory in our eyes, I shout and sing. Thank you. 
chastisement for our peace will be on him, and by his stripes we are healed. Let's pray. Father God, we stand in awe that you would send one such as this, received in this way, to sacrifice his body as the perfect lamb of God. It gives us hope, encouragement, all peace and reverence as we partake of this bread that is his body. Help us to realize the gift today, Father. And help us to partake of it in a way that pleases you. Amen. Amen. Passover, that transcends to the cross, that transcends to resurrection, that transcends to a hope of eternity. Made for us, his people, to be thought of and remembered on the first day of the week. Again from Isaiah. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who will declare his generation? He was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people he was stricken. They made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence. There was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He was put to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed and prolong his days. 
and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with transgressors. He bore the sins of many. He intercedes. Let us pray. Father, for a gift such as this, we stand in awe. For the perfect blood of the perfect lamb of your only son, we praise you today. And as we take of this cup, help us realize the gift in awe, in reverence, in respect, in joy for all that it means from the past, to the cross, to his resurrection, and for eternity. In his name, amen. <clears throat> gather around this table this morning we've been made mindful of your son giving his life for us Lord that we may have a home in heaven with you at this time let the spirit move through our hearts Lord let's give cheerfully and freely so these funds can be used to further your kingdom go with us this week in Jesus name amen
chapter 9. In just a few moments, we will read Matthew chapter 9. Uh, I'm going to read, actually, a share a passage with you from John chapter 14, but the main part of our text this morning will come from Matthew chapter 9. In John's account, John writes in chapter 14 about Jesus making these interesting comments. Now, most of us, when we think about John chapter 14, uh, many of us are thinking about, you know, in my father's house are many mansions, you know, if it were not so I would have told you. We think about Jesus in verse 6 saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. We, we focus on some really important aspects of John 14. There's one beautiful aspect in John 14 that I think often goes overlooked. In Verse 7 of John 14, reading through verse 11, Jesus makes, the, makes this statement. He says these things. He says, if you had known me, you would have known my Father. Now, let me just kind of give you just a short statement. Jesus is basically saying, I have come. Now, now mind you, for many different reasons, ultimately for the purpose of of dying for our sins. We, we get that. And from JB's reading this morning from Isaiah 53, also you might just kind of connect Isaiah 53 and Psalm 22. Both of those are talking about the suffering servant. And so, yes, he came to, to die for our sins. But Jesus is saying in this passage, I've come to show you what the Father's like. Now, let, let me continue reading and you'll just kind of get more of this idea. He, he says, if you had known me, you would have known my father also. And from now on, I know him 
and have seen him. Verse 8, Philip said, Lord, show us the Father and it's sufficient for us. You're talking about showing us what God's like. You're saying that you are in the, have come in, in the person of, of, of God to show us what the Father's like. Well, just show him to us. I mean, that'll be enough. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long and yet you have not known me, Philip? That's a question. And I wonder what Philip was thinking as a response to that question. I mean, think about it. From Jesus' statement, he's the one asking the question. There were many different proofs, right, that Jesus gave that he was God in the flesh. Many times he would say things like, I and the Father are one, or, you know, if you've seen me like in this passage, you've seen the Father. Well, then he did God-like things. So he says, have I been with you so long and yet you don't know me, Philip? He who has seen me, underline this, has seen the Father. I've come to show you what God is like, what the Father is like. If you've seen me, you've seen him. So how can you say, show us the Father, which is what he said, right? What Philip said. Do not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me. The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Again, I, I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I, and I actually, I think I mentioned it in the Bible class. But just understand that, you know, the words that Jesus gave us came from God the Father. And also the words that, Jesus, that God gave Men like Paul and Peter and James and John and Luke and Mark, you know, and Jude. Those came from the Father as well. Same source. But he says, if you don't believe me for any other reason, at least believe me at the end of verse 10 because of the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. He came to show us what God's like. Who does God want to be in his family? I mean, when you think about people in your life and in your circle, when you think about people who uh, you work with, when you think about those people that maybe uh, uh, are a little bit on the outcast part of society, when you think about just people in general, who is it that you think God invites to be a part of his family? People who think like you, act like you, you know, the same color as you. Is that, is that kind of what we think? Sometimes that's what we think. It's what some people think. But is that really what we see in Jesus? Like, who would be welcome in this church? I was talking with Brother Kerbo this morning. He said, I got a good sermon title for you. If God wrote a letter to Washington Street, what would it say? Well, I think in one sense, as we're thinking about this lesson, what, we, what Jesus would say is, here's who's welcome here. So my question to you, as we see this uh, sermon unfold, as we see this story unfold, we know who Jesus is going to want to be a part of this family. My question is, would he be welcome here? Would he be welcome in this church? Would she be welcome in this church? Yeah, you know, we've got all these ideas about who we want to be a part of the family. Who do we want relationship with? I think maybe more appropriately to consider is who did Jesus develop a relationship with? And wouldn't it be safe to say in some respects, <coughs> excuse me, wouldn't it be safe to say in some respects that who Jesus had relationship with is who we should have or develop relationship with? Like the very people that Jesus was reaching are the same people that we should be reaching? Do you think that's a fair assessment? Now, we do have this story in Matthew chapter 9, uh, beginning with verses 9 through 13. And this is actually, Matthew's the gospel writer. He wrote the gospel of Matthew, the gospel according to Matthew. And, and wrote it for a Jewish audience in general. What's interesting is Matthew tells his own story. Now, there are snippets, for example, in other Gospels that allude to the author. John will do that. 
But Matthew actually shares his story, his own story. In verse 9, as Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Well, let's just stop there for just a moment. If you're reading in Mark chapter 2, verse 13 or 14, you kind of get the idea that uh, his name is also Levi. Now, think about this for a moment. How many of you are parents here? A lot of parents here. Praise God for graduation, amen? <laughs> yeah, we're looking forward to that. Uh, no, but, but as parents, think about you know, all of the dreams, the aspirations, the, the just given a name. You know, name, a name is connecting, isn't it? We, we, we give names because it means something. You know, there's something in, in, in a name, right? There's power in a name. There's a story in a name. Well, all of our kids, there's a story with their name, right? Think about when Matthew, Levi, when Levi's parents named him, you know that's a great Bible name, right? That's a great Jewish tribal name. I mean, there's, there's power in that. There, there, there are dreams and aspirations. I mean, can you imagine when, when Matthew's parents named him Levi? What they anticipated, what they dreamed of, all of the, the things that they thought this son would grow up to be. And now we learn in verse 9 that he's a tax collector. Now, now to give you a little bit, and I don't want to get too in-depth in thinking about the whole idea of being a tax collector, but it, it was like, you know, there were, there were the normal sinners, right, like murderers and and, and <laughs> rapists and, you know, all of these normal sinners, you know, but, but then there are tax collectors. Like, they were so despised, they were their own special section of sinners. Like, there's tax collectors and sinners. That's the way it, it's worded in Scripture even most of the time. A tax collector is someone who is working on behalf of the Roman government to actually collect taxes. Okay. And, and, and if we kind of just put two and two together, and most of the time, this was a position that was bid on. And, and Rome would award it to the highest bidder. And then you have these, these chief tax collectors who hire all of these other tax collectors to go out and actually do their tax collecting. And they made money uh, from the chief tax collector who made money from the Roman government. And so basically what you have is you have a scenario where You've got people who have sold out to the Roman government. And in this case, a Jewish man with a lot of intention, even with his name, turns his back on his Jewish family and works for the Roman government. I, I don't think we can understate, as Matthew tells his own story, that he was a tax collector sitting in a tax booth collecting taxes from his Jewish countrymen. And Jesus walks by in verse 9, follow me, he told him, and Matthew got up and followed him. And while Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, so this went from just casual you're going to follow me to now I'm going home with you. I'm going to sit with you and I'm going to sit with all your tax collector's friends at your home. And, and, and many tax collectors, other tax collectors, and there it is again, and sinners, that's the normal sinners, uh, came and ate with him and his disciples. His disciples were there as well. And when the Pharisees saw this, they asked the disciples, now, now get this, they're not asking Jesus. And I want to talk about this aspect in just a moment, but they asked the disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, they said, it's not the healthy who, uh, it, Jesus said, it is not the healthy uh, who need a doctor, but the sick. Uh, I want to talk about that as well. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, for I have not come to call the righteous. 
but sinners. Can he come to church here? Can she come to church here? Would they be welcome here? I want you to think about that for a moment. And again, this interesting statement that John makes, he's showing us what God is like. Matthew is telling this story about Jesus. And I want you to think about it. Jesus, in, in the perspective of the two groups that we read about in Matthew 9, verses 9 through 11, you, you've, got, you've got tax collectors and sinners, and then you've got the Pharisees, the righteous, the religious rulers of the day. And Jesus, more than likely, has more in common with the, with the scribes and the Pharisees who have at least a, an understanding of God, a love for God to some extent they would. And, and, and yet, their hearts are miles apart. Jesus may have actually been closer in heart to the others. I mean, this same Matthew who tells his own story is the same guy who says in Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20, he's the same guy who records Jesus saying, you know, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore make disciples. What kind of disciples? Who's welcomed here? Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things. Teaching them. Who's the them? That I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now let's think about what we can learn from this story this morning. I, I think there are some pretty important lessons. Number one, the Father's not ashamed of you. I don't care who you are or where you're from or what you have done. God is not ashamed of you. And He wants you in His family. Re regardless of what people think and regardless of how people act, Jesus came to show us what God is like and He's screaming out to every one of us that even the worst of us are welcomed in His family with open arms. As a matter of fact, I want you to think about the Gospels and why they are written for just a moment. I think this is important to bring out. So every Gospel account, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, have intent for why they were written. I mentioned a moment ago, Matthew was mainly written for a Jewish audience, right? Mark was written with the intent of showing power to show the Romans. It was written for more of a Roman audience that, that Jesus is, is God's power. There's power in Jesus Christ. Luke gives us more of the humanity of Jesus, right? And, and writes more to a Greek audience, maybe using a little more reason. You might remember John. Now, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are part of what we call the Synoptic Gospels. I've mentioned that before. They see the story in the same way. John was written later, and, and John's Gospel is not a part of... He tells a lot of different stories. But yet, there's still intent with John's Gospel, right? Chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. These things I've written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ and that believing you may have life in His name. John tells us at the end, here's why I've written this. It's more of a universal gospel. It gives us a lot of... But, but what about Matthew? Let's get back to Matthew. Have you thought about this Jewish audience that Matthew's writing to? And more than anything else, I want you to understand he's writing about the kingdom. More than anything else, if you just look up how many times Matthew talks about in his gospel account, whether he's recording John saying it, whether he's recording Jesus saying it, whether he's just making statements as he's writing about it, uh, uh, many times in his gospel account he talks about the kingdom. As a matter of fact, the first time is in chapter 3, Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, where he talks about John, the Baptist, who came preaching the kingdom of God and how he told everyone, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Or what about Matthew chapter 4, verse 23, when he talks about the gospel of the kingdom? And then you might remember there are several places in Matthew's gospel where he says, the kingdom of heaven is like dot, dot, dot. It's like, for example, a mustard seed. What a powerful lesson there. It's like leaven. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. It, and then he talks about the word of the kingdom. There is a word for the kingdom. He talks about the kingdoms like a treasure. 
Something that when we, when we find it, we need to sell out, sell everything, and go all in and embrace it and purchase it. He says it's like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, that pearl of great price. Matthew chapter 13, verse 47. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet that was cast into the sea and gathers some of every kind. Now, mind you, there will be a moment where the fishermen, where God will separate the good fish from the bad fish, but that's not our job. Right? Our job is to cast a net and not try to decide what fish we want and what fish we don't. Matthew chapter 18, verse 3, And assuredly I say to you, unless you are converted and become like little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. This is a pretty powerful thing. And I want you to understand there's not something different here versus something else in heaven. It's all the same. If you're a part of the kingdom here, you're a part of the kingdom there. There's not two different kingdoms. There's not two different standards. There's one king, one kingdom. You might remember in Matthew chapter 16, beginning with verse 18. Also, and also, I say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my what? church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys to the kingdom. They're the same. There's no difference in church and kingdom. Jesus came. He established a movement. That movement was a called out group, the ecclesia, the called out group for Christ. That's who they were. This kingdom and church are the same. In Matthew chapter 18, verse 23, therefore the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts. We talked about that last week. Right? What if we had to pay back everything? Well, praise God, we don't. Matthew chapter 19, verse 23, then Jesus said to his disciples, Assuredly, I say to you that it's harder for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. I, I want you to know that I've actually, there are a lot of people trying to determine, well, what, what did Jesus mean, right, when he said it's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God? And there's a lot of different things that are written about it. I, I, I want to say I, I did a lot of study on this. I tried to determine what is Jesus saying? And I, I believe it or not, I came up with the conclusion. I have the answer. I know there's a lot written. What did Jesus mean when he said it's hard for a rich man? Which, by the way, we're all wealthy in here. According to world standards, we're, we're extremely wealthy. Every one of us, even the poorest of us in here, is wealthy worldwide. But what did Jesus mean? It's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. That's it. It's not tough. This kingdom business is important. As a matter of fact, in Matthew 20, verse 1, for the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. And it's up to him who he hires and when he hires them and what he pays. Not us. Matthew 21, verse 31, which of the two did the will of the Father, and they said to him, the first one, Jesus said, assuredly, I say to you, that tax collectors and harlots enter God before you. Do you think, do you think Matthew, the tax collector, listened up when Jesus said that? Do you think when, when Matthew's writing his gospel account, and he's wanting the world to know what God's family is like, that, that he put that in there for purpose? For meaning, absolutely. You might remember Matthew chapter 22, verse 2. The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for a son. And I believe this was certainly uh, in, 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 in the perspective and contextually about the Jews being given an invitation. But they didn't accept it. He's going to offer it to everyone else and exclude them. I know many of you have read Matthew 25. You know, that's the parable of the talents or the parable of the virgins. Five prepared, five unprepared. The talents, he gave different talents to three different people and two of them used them wisely, one of them didn't. You know, th think about this whole 
perspective in Matthew chapter 25, especially verse 34, the king will say to those on the right hand, come, blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Come on in. How many of you want to hear one day, come on in, folks? Right? We want to hear that. Matthew chapter 26, beginning with verse 29, but I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it with you new in my Father's kingdom. That kingdom ultimately would be established at Calvary. Entrance would be offered at Pentecost. And here is God's family and who's welcome. And Matthew wants us to understand that everyone is welcome. I mean, think about it. Let, let me ask you this question. How many of you have been perfect since the day you were born? Anyone? Oh, Joe raised his hand. Yeah, yeah. My, my mom, my mom on our wedding day, true story, told Christie's mom, I want you to know Charles is perfect. <laughs> Did she not? My mother never spoke truer words. <laughs> but none of us are perfect in reality. All joking aside, none of us are perfect. We're all sick. In need of the physician to heal our sin sick soul. Think about it. When JB read Isaiah 53 a moment ago, you know, look at what we did to Jesus. You know, we, we, we killed him. He shed his blood for our sins, but look at what he does for us. He opens his arm and he says, My blood is available to you and to everyone you invite. Go invite them, compel them to come in from the highways and the byways. They are welcomed in my family. But my question is would we welcome them here? I think Matthew tells his own story to let us catch a glimpse of the fact that it doesn't matter who you are or what, or what you've done. You are welcome in God's family. I mean, someone sitting next to you this morning may be someone struggling with some sort of addiction. Maybe an unwanted pregnancy. I don't know. Some deep-seated fear. Some personal struggle. Are they welcomed if you know all about them? The good, the bad, and the ugly? Hopefully we would say yes. I want to tell you, folks aren't through with sinning just because they're in church. In fact, many of us are here because we struggle. Don't we? Every one of us. But I think back to Matthew's parents, and I don't think that they had in mind what Matthew was doing as a part of their dreams and aspirations. You know, I, I think a little bit about the sarcasm of the disciples. I, I don't know if you pick up on stuff like this, but when you're reading through, like if you're reading John chapter 11, you know, Jesus learns about Lazarus. He gets word from Martha and Mary, and your friend Lazarus is sick, and then ultimately he dies. And, and you might remember in that whole discussion, Jesus says, well, we're going to go and we're going we're gonna to see Lazarus. We're going to see Mary. We're going to see Martha. But you might remember the disciples bring up to him, well, you know, the last time we were there, they wanted to kill you. Are you sure you want to go back? And Jesus is basically like, yes, we're going back. I'm going back. The disciples said, we will go with you too that we may die with you. Depending on how you view what they say, could give a different perspective. Like, are, there show, are they showing their allegiance for Jesus? They brought up, listen, the last time you were there, they want to kill you. Is this more sarcasm? Like, okay, we'll go and die with you too if that's what you want to do. You know, I, I don't know. I don't really know. But I do believe that they had some sarcasm. And I believe that, that as we think about how Jesus is not ashamed of you and He's not ashamed of me, He wasn't ashamed of Matthew or Matthew's friends, I want you to understand that as these disciples have this little side discussion with uh, the, the religious rulers of the day, that, that they say, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Why does he do that? And, and I, have, would you just like to be a fly on the wall like when they're sitting around a campfire and having discussion without Jesus? Like, doesn't Jesus know this makes us look bad? 
like our friends don't like tax collectors and sinners. Like, doesn't he realize this is ruining our reputation here? <laughs> now, now, the Bible doesn't say that. And yes, I am speculating, but I know what conversation is like, and so do you. And, and not that that really makes a massive difference here, other than I believe that Jesus, if he were to hear a conversation like that, he would say, if it saves the soul, it doesn't matter one bit about your reputation. I, I, I don't know that he would, they said that, and I don't know that he would say that, but I think that he would say, listen, I came to seek and to save that which is lost. They are lost and they need me. But number two, I want you to know the Father's not ashamed of your friends. Now, I do want to make a point that at some moment in life, friendships have to change if they're negative and bad. I mean, I, I am making a point about Jesus talking to a tax collector and going in Matthew's home and meeting with other sinners and tax collectors. Yeah, that's the point I'm making. But who did Jesus spend the majority of his time with? All of those kinds of people or the people that he selected? Who were his closest friends? Who were his comrades in arms? The ones that he chose carefully. There is a side in life where we have to reach out and we're not better than anyone else. And, and we need to open our arms and love everyone. There's also a side where we have personal responsibility with our own spiritual life and nature. And if we have friends that are not helping us in that direction, at some point, like Jesus, when he sent them out in the limited commission, we have to shake the dust off of our feet. That's also part of kingdom business. It's a difficult part, but I want you to understand that Jesus, at least at this point, is not ashamed of your friends. He wants your friends in his family as much as you want your friends in his family. But if your friends at some point decide not to be a part of the family, then you've got to embrace family and accept them with open arms more than anyone else in this life. Jesus would say things, you got to love me more than mom and dad, brother, sister, even friends. But Jesus goes home with these friends. Not only does the Father want our friends, but He goes into the house of Matthew and sits down and eats with them. And that shows intimacy. That shows love. That, that shows that He's not ashamed to have fellowship with them. I want you to think about this for a moment. I'm always amazed at, at the comments that Jesus makes when he's around certain groups of people. Like, like you think about this for a moment. You know, everyone's excited. They, bring, they, invite, they invite people to church, and Jesus is up talking one day, and, and they're so excited. I mean, I'm telling you, we have found the Messiah. And then he gets up and he says something like, the kingdom of heaven is like a sower who sows seed. And it falls on different ground. And then he tells this parable, and not everyone's really getting what he's saying. As a matter of fact, the disciples don't. And they start to ask questions, and Jesus would say things like, well, they're not going to get it. They're, they're not going to get it. Only people who really want to get it will get it. That means the people who want to dig a little deeper, develop a little more relationship, want to look under the pages of Scripture to find out, they will get it. But not everyone will. Now, how would you like to invite people to Washington Street and say, we've got this new preacher. We've got this new preacher. I've got a knife here. Someone throw that at me. Time to serve a uh, We've got this new preacher, you know. And then, then I get up and I preach a sermon no one understands. And I basically say, y'all are not going to get it. And, and the friends that you invited think, what in the world? Jesus is sitting at Matthew's house and he knows that the disciples have had this little side discussion. And he says, in that house, among all of those people, listen, it's not the, the, what hell, the wealthy or the healthy that need a physician. Who needs a physician? The sick. I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners. 
What is Jesus saying about Matthew's tax collectors and friends? You're sick. I mean, can you imagine them sitting around the table and going, this guy, Matthew, you invited us here to hear that we're sick. Everyone's invited to the family. But don't forget, he's the great physician. He wants to change us. He doesn't want us to stay the same. That first passage I told you in Matthew 3, when it brings our attention to John the Baptist, you know part of the message about the kingdom is this idea of repentance. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. In order to be a part of family, you have to repent. Everyone's welcome, but a change must occur. We're catching a glimpse here of the Father. We're catching a glimpse of who's invited to, to the family. I think what happens is, in our desire to protect our children and to give them a safe and happy world, sometimes we, we sort of pad the picture, don't we, of life around them and you know we we try to hide them from what's really out there the reality of the real world well I want you to know that Jesus didn't do that Jesus said here's what it's like and you're invited you're welcome here Matthew is saying I'm writing this story to talk about the kingdom and the kingdom has you in it, regardless of who you are and what you've done. Again, I don't know where you are at this moment in your life. And honestly, you don't know where I am. But I know that we are all sin sick in need of a Savior. And praise God for those of us who have accepted the blood of Jesus to have our sins washed away. But you can as well this morning, if you will step out in faith. Except Jesus, be covered by his blood for forgiveness reigns. If we can help you, please respond. How we got this day? Who will follow Jesus and he will arrive? Holding up his banner in the thickest fight. Listening for his orders, ready to obey. Who will follow Jesus? Susan are in the back. If y'all just wave at us or you can stand, it's totally up to you. But uh, very grateful to see those two in the back. Those are your new family members here. Let, let me just give a quick little statement. Um, you know, in order to be a part of the church, the Lord just asks that you respond to His grace, right? To be uh, accepting of His love. Uh, as a part of our spiritual family here at Washington Street, there's nothing else you have to do than what's required by Jesus. Our elders, uh, as, as our spiritual shepherds, like to meet with those who want to be a part of our spiritual family here, which certainly uh, makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? They're going to be spiritual shepherds over these sheep, and so they met with uh, Kevin and Susan this week. 
I know that we have two other families that are wanting to place their membership here. And uh, they are members of the body of Christ uh, at large. Our elders will be meeting with them soon. That's just generally how uh, they do it. So they just meet with them, communicate with them, let them know they're excited to be a, uh, for them to be a part of our spiritual family. But that's, that's what uh, they do. And I'm, I'm grateful for our elders, Alan and JB, and for their willingness to have open arms and to reach out to those who want to be a part of our spiritual family. And so we're grateful for that. But we're so grateful for Kevin and Susan. Welcome to the family. Thank you for being here. Mary actually has the prayer list and the closing prayer today, but uh, just uh, as worship was beginning this morning, Laura got a text from our sister-in-law, Lynette Young, um, and I just wanted to ask the congregation here to be praying for the Glenn Davis family. Her dad, Glenn Davis, in Chattanooga passed away this morning, um, and uh, he's been struggling with cancer. Of course, his, her mom just passed away in end of January, and so... Uh, Glenn and Sue were great workers for the Lord, and, uh, but, it, but we're never ready to say goodbye to our loved ones. And so if you would, please remember William and Lynette uh, Young, and then the, the family of Glenn Davis, who passed away this morning. Okay. I want to mention a few more on our prayer list. Uh, Troy Bates will have eye surgery tomorrow. I want to remember him. Uh, Billy Ogle, uncle of Tori Young, passed away Friday. His visitation will be tomorrow from 5 till 8 in the evening, and again on Tuesday from noon until 2, which is the time of the funeral service. And the visitation and the funeral will be held at Pleasant Hill Baptist Church. And then congratulations to Joseph and Katie Taylor on the birth of their daughter, Laura Clementine Taylor. She was born May 6th and is the great niece of Drew and Tori Young. So let's remember them in our prayers. Let's pray them together. Our gracious Father, we are so thankful for all the many blessings you give us for the beautiful day we have. And Father, thankful for you being with us this morning. Uh, we're thankful that we were able to praise you and to gather around your son's table, commune with you, with one another. Father, to hear a great, great message from your word. Father, we do pray for these that we've mentioned. We pray for the Troy Bates and, uh, and the young family and the loss of, uh, of Billy Ogle and also the, the birth of uh, little Laura Clementine and, uh, and the Davis family that Mark mentioned, Father. And we know others, Father, that need you in a special way. We pray for them. And Father, we pray for our graduating seniors uh, as they soon will be beginning a, a, a new chapter in their lives. And Father, help us uh, as we've heard this morning Help us to open our arms, open our arms wide to all as we invite people in to be with us. And help us this morning as we leave. Uh, give us new strength, new courage, and new power as we go out into this world and try to be your light. Not only here in Fayetteville, but wherever we may go. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.